everyone, and welcome to Reimagine, the virtual blockchain conference, coming at you with our 11th event with some really exciting content. We are on the road, we're on tour, getting high quality content with people both in person and virtually like today, uh, reporting back on what's going on in San Francisco, New York, El Salvador, as well as some of the biggest developments in NFTs and DAOs. I'm your co-host, Ashley Meredith, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to Nicholas Carey, co-founder and president of blockchain.com. Welcome. How are you doing today? Thank you, Meredith. It's really lovely to be with you. Well, we're so happy to have you. Um, so for those of you just tuning in, be sure to check out some of our previous interviews over on YouTube. Smash that subscribe button. We've interviewed people from blockchain.com uh, before. Check out our past interviews, uh, doing amazing work in the space, building the infrastructure and the lily pads, as we'll uh, discuss later, <laughs> um, helping to uh, really make blockchain adoption happen. Um, so this year we've seen digital and decentralized technologies absolutely dominate on the world stage. The crypto revolution is unstoppable. El Salvador making Bitcoin legal tender, corporations turning into DAOs, NFT boom showing no signs of stopping. Um, I think people are accepting that the future of finance, art and culture is a, and collaboration is digital. Uh, so can you tell our viewers, you know, from the perspective of a company like blockchain.com, you know, where we've been the last decade and, and where we're going. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. I think you make some great points. Like technology has always been the driving force in history. You know, we uh, captured fire, we invented the wheel, we paved roads. We're always in a state of trying to improve where we were before. And I think that that uh, concentration on that is one of the things that differentiates um, everything about humans versus uh, all the other species in the planet. One of the things though that's interesting is that we've also tried different forms of money. Money is a very ancient and old construct. Uh, it actually predates written word. So we find um, in burial sites in Northern Scotland, uh, pearls and seashells that came from very far away. So it's best to probably understand money as some sort of social consensus that allows us to exchange wealth. And we've tested all kinds of different mediums um, to do that. Uh, everything from seashells to pearls, to feathers, to coins, to gold, um, and then fiat currency. So if we wanted to invent a better form of money, one that would be uh, suited for the age of the internet, where we're broadcasting and teleporting precious information all over the world instantly, what would we give uh, that money? What design principles would we want to apply to it? And this is some of the cool stuff that's been going on in the cryptocurrency industry over the past decade. And it is pretty incredible if you think back on what's been achieved in the last uh, 10 years. And we just celebrated the uh, 13th birthday of the Satoshi Nakamoto uh, white paper, which um, is obviously the seminal work that sort of unleashed a uh, tidal wave of innovation, curiosity, and innovation in the design of monetary policy systems and technology. Um, and blockchain.com has been in, at the forefront of building tools and kit and technology that helps uh, empower individuals to control their own wealth. And that's been something that's been dear and near to our hearts from the very beginning. We just celebrated our own 10 year anniversary um, on October 15th. And we actually have a really exciting promotion going on right now. So if anyone is still skeptical about getting into crypto, um, you can sign up for a blockchain.com wallet. And if you buy your first hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, we're gonna give you $50 worth of Bitcoin for free. And uh, this is a gift to all the new crypto curious users out there. The wallets are free to download. You can install them from iOS or Android or get a web wallet. Um, so we please welcome everyone to do that. So speaking very broadly, it's important to kind of study what's happened. Um, you know, Satoshi pioneered the concept of a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Since then, we've seen the novel innovations of blockchains that are capable of doing much more advanced computations and agreements that are a little more complicated that humans sort of need in order to provide sort of new social, uh, I would say collaborations um, and, uh, and contracts. So you might hear the things about smart contracts and things like that. Um, this is a, a very predictable outcome from the initial experimentation and now, not only is it not just financial agreements that are getting um, programmed around money, but we're seeing the explosion of incredible uh, creative capabilities around artwork, music, and content. And so um, in short, you know, at blockchain.com, one decade into uh, doing this work, we've had over 78 million people sign up. Our users have conducted over a trillion dollars worth of on-chain transactions. Um, and uh, one third of the worldwide uh, on-chain Bitcoin traffic originates from blockchain.com wallets. So we've been at this for a long time. We're really gonna be concentrating over the next decade on building the passport to the future of financial services. It's in our mission 
to make sure we empower end users to control their wealth and have tools to enable them, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, to be able to send, receive, secure, trade, and exchange digital forms of money. And so I'm super excited to explore all of the exciting innovations that have happened the last year. And then maybe think a little bit about, you know, what's going to happen over the next decade as policy, money, and technology all merge together and give us new tools uh, to build wealth and collaborate and, and share how we're going to basically uh, build the future of a financial economy that's grafted into the internet that empowers all people in a way that we were never able to do previously. Absolutely. And, and blockchain.com has experienced massive growth. I think the last time we talked with someone from your team, you had tripled your users last year or something like that. Yeah, it's been a very uh, intense period of growth. We've seen more users sign up in the past 12 months than we had uh, in terms of speed than in any previous uh, period of time. We've also grown our team tremendously. Um, we've raised more money than we ever have before and uh, we're hiring like crazy. So um, short, uh, a little plug, if you are interested in working in the crypto space across all of our teams, whether that's the uh, backend engineering, the front end, the creative side um, on product or sales or asset management or custody, um, we have a lot of open roles. So please visit blockchain.com forward slash careers. Um, we'd love to find the best people in the world to help us deliver on the mission. But yeah, it's, uh, it's been a, a very good, but very stressful year in terms of adding muscle to the organization. And in a lot of ways, we really feel like we're just getting started. Um, we are trying to build an, uh, you know, a company that uh, persists through time and ultimately takes care of our customers and our team so that we can build amazing things uh, that help individuals control their wealth. Absolutely. Uh, and in your mind, what do you think dr is driving this growth in just the last year? Is it uh, retail investors stuck at home with COVID trying to find something to, uh, to do or uh, secondary ways of making income? Is it the NFT boom, just the inflection point combination of things? Yeah, actually, it's a great question. Like, uh, I think if you were to pull Twitter, you get a lot of different answers. Um, my personal perspective is there's there's some macroeconomic um, conditions that are really conspiring to make crypto extraordinarily relevant uh, more than ever today. You have non-transitory inflation. Um, in the last year, uh, the central banks across the world in response to the COVID crisis um, provided extraordinarily extraordinary levels of liquidity uh, to the markets, meaning they literally made a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And that money is flushing through the economy, but it's concentrating in the pockets of a very few number of people. And it's also causing asset prices across all kinds of things that regular people need access to, to increase, whether that's food or oil or uh, the, the cost of grass and soil, uh, seeds, everything's getting more expensive because there's a lot more money flushing through the system. This is pretty concerning. Um, on the other side of things, you have real disintermediation happening in the financial services space by fintechs, by cryptocurrency companies, um, and by innovative uh, traditional financial companies that are trying to figure out how to respond to building uh, capabilities to suit the modern needs. You have incredible innovation happening in our industry though, if you're able to develop a type of money that can teleport around the world instantly at low cost, you massively decrease the barriers to entry for people to perform commerce, to start companies, uh, and to trade with each other. And that's a big deal. We have um, modular financial applications, user-controlled ownership. You have the ability to develop yield for the first time uh, in especially negative, a negative interest rate environment. So I'm in London tonight across the entire Eurozone. Um, all of uh, individuals that store euros in their bank accounts are actually losing purchasing power on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, between the disintermediation happening globally in financial services, I think the innovation in our industry, the yield opportunities, and then finally digital hardness, which is an important concept, um, especially Bitcoin and some of the other digital currencies that use sound money principles um, are adding a new asset class that large institutions are taking much more seriously than ever before. In 2017, we heard some rumors that the institutions were gonna come into crypto. In 2021, they are coming, but they're also coming at sort of a later stage. And what's interesting is that there are now hundreds of millions of retail users that have access and custody and control over their own cryptocurrencies. And the institutions are coming a little late to the party, but they are coming because they don't have other places to allocate capital they can give them consistent returns, help them manage their own um, wealth preservation strategies. And so now it's, it's no longer a conversation about, well, I don't really believe in this stuff, but it's actually just a portfolio management, risk management conversation. And so you're seeing the likes of 
uh, crossover investors um, from the largest institutions in the world. We took capital from Bailey Gifford, one of the most significant asset managers in the world. Um, just uh, this week, we've heard uh, uh, DCG, the digital currency group in New York, close a large round of financing led by Google and SoftBank. Um, and there's just hundreds of examples now of just uh, large institutions holding treasury in crypto as well as um, investing in cryptocurrency projects, companies, and entrepreneurs. And so the biggest difference is you've got institutions, you've got a cultural zeitgeist in the uh, artists and the musicians and the NFT space, and you've got the crypto OGs that are all pushing um, basically this whole phenomena forward at incredible speed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, the kind of the macroeconomic conditions that have made this a really uh, kind of inflection point for crypto adoption, uh, just last uh, month, El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender. Uh, what do you think about this decision? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm a, you know, we always sort of predicted uh, that eventually, you know, nation states would start to hold um, crypto treasury. And uh, my perspective is there are some interesting criticisms of how that was um, pushed through in El Salvador. But without argument, um, to me, smaller countries and medium-sized countries and soon big countries are going to realize that accessing a market that enables anyone in the world to send receive secure trade exchange precious information is going to be very useful and valuable to their own countries and to their citizens. And um, I'm, you know, without a doubt so far, we've seen uh, pretty impressive adoption in El Salvador. Um, even from our own metricing, uh, the number of users um, from El Salvador that have signed up for blockchain.com wallets has increased um, in, uh, in the time since that announcement was made. So, you know, it's in the mainstream media, there's a kind of a constant drumming around, well, crypto is only for nerds. Crypto is only for, you know, uh, people that had access to uh, technology. Crypto is only used by a few small companies on the internet. Crypto is only used by a few uh, small countries. But like the argument is sort of just sort of washing away slowly as a castle in the sand does. Um, more and more uh, people are paying attention to what's happening. And uh, I think the pioneering efforts of El Salvador will be copied by other countries. How that happens, I hope generally takes on a more... Um, less top-down approach and more of one that's uh, consensus driven from uh, democratic processes. But at the end of the day, more people getting access to digital currencies in a legal way um, is extraordinarily interesting. And so uh, I'm you know, very excited to see more, uh, more initiatives like it. Absolutely. Well, the International Monetary Fund labeled cryptoization as a threat to the global economy. What do you think the Bitcoin decision in El Salvador, uh, how will that affect the wider global economy? So my view is that a lot of the large policy groups like the IMF or the World Bank um, are still in the learning curve and they're catching up quickly. Um, it's easy to label things that look concerning or confusing um, as threats, but it's also super important to understand um, some of the value systems that underpin the technology. And if these institutions really care about financial inclusion, if they really care about access uh, to financial services that can get down uh, to anyone that has access to a smartphone, um, we can really level the playing field so that at least everyone has an equal opportunity to participate in the economy. And so when I think about what we're really trying to achieve in the crypto industry, um, and this is a personal view, we're really just trying to wrap the planet in an economic fab fabric that all people have access to, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, to do things like send, receive, secure, trade, exchange, digital forms of wealth. And so I'm hopeful that these larger institutions, as they come up the learning curve of everything from stable coins to central backed digital currencies to just digital currencies and digital assets, um, that they'll see some of the positive uh, benefits of these things and uh, hopefully turn the page on some of, I would say, belabored criticisms that we've continually addressed um, and have taken quite seriously over the last decade. But the reality is that these things are being adopted because, they're, uh, because people find them useful that's extremely important. No one's coercing anyone to do these things. So if they're useful um, and there's some economic uh, designs in them that make them valuable, they're gonna command market prices. Uh, and the fact to me that anyone in the world can start to use these things um, speaks really truly to the humanity of them, which is a, an important argument. Yeah, I guess there's a bit of coercion happening in El Salvador, however, um, 
requiring businesses to accept Bitcoin? Do you think that's a good or a bad thing? My hope is that people would adopt it without any coercion whatsoever. Um, you know, in the same way that I uh, would prefer that um, any country not force anyone uh, to use one type of uh, religious standard or one type of vocabulary standard or one type of language. Um, and a single monetary policy, I think, also fits into a similar category of, you know, how do you really consider people's freedom to, you know, use the labors of their time and the efforts that they have um, to do things with whatever they determine to be money? And so in, in the long term, I think um, enough uh, retail adoption sort of causes society to change its perspective on these things, but it's a slow thing. Um, you know, a decade ago, people were making, um, you know, really crude arguments against crypto. We're still seeing that a little bit today, but the conversation has dramatically evolved. And um, when you have everybody from, you know, the wealthiest person in the world um, running some of the most impressive, innovative companies advocating on behalf of crypto, you know, it causes people to take pause and pay attention. And when you have the largest IPO of 2021, you know, be a cryptocurrency company, people are starting to pay attention. And when we think about how do we build an economy that's inclusive, that gives people equal access of opportunity, we need to be serious about, you know, thinking through um, the policy that enables and encourages uh, further innovation generally. And the financial services sector, the traditional financial services space has not delivered um, for many billions of people around the world. And fintech and especially crypto, um, I think is uh, extraordinarily well tooled to deliver financial services at scale to anyone. Absolutely. Well, uh, moving on to some of the other kind of biggest conversations in crypto right now, many corporations are considering becoming DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, what is blockchain.com thinking about down, DAOs or yourself? Have you seen it work particularly well? Any particular projects that come to mind um, or any drawbacks to a, a DAO model that you can think of? Yeah, so decentralized autonomous organizations are sort of at the like, I would say the absolute um, cutting edge of what's happening in consensus driven organization. And how do you align incentives across disparate groups of people to coordinate time, um, to compensate them, and ultimately build stuff people find useful. So uh, they, you know, we, in a lot of ways, it's sort of like to be determined still. Um, but I'm not surprised that these things exist. And um, let a thousand flowers, you know, or a thousand seeds be spread and uh, some flowers bloom. So I, I'm excited to see uh, how these organizations navigate um, what is a very difficult challenge, um, which is to build stuff people find useful. And we have a lot of different governance mechanisms in uh, what I would call like the molecular world, AKA running companies, building uh, institutions, nonprofits, um, charities, uh, you know, uh, schools, universities. So can all that stuff actually be, you know, just programmed into an application that runs on the internet? Um, I think it can eventually, but we also have to get good um, at working uh, in decentralized ways really making sure people are held accountable. Um, roadmaps for projects um, have thing deadlines and having you know, uh, accountability at an individual contributor level for all these things being uh, navigated. It's just, it, it's a big challenge, um, but we've seen some interesting uh, implementations of this. Um, you know, famously this year, um, the, uh, it was um, the Fox token uh, project uh, run by Shapeshift um, the founder basically decentralized his entire company, wrote it into a smart contract, gave everybody that was ever a user and all of his shareholders equal voting rights into the project uh, and how they work in the future. And, you know, that is a super bold, super pioneering spirit that I think really carries the vanguard of the crypto movement. And we need to see more projects like this try and experiment. The only way we'll know whether or not it works is if we see, um, you know, communities adopt these services compensate these services and reward the contributors of those services over the long run. And so um, in the long run, I am excited in the short term. Let's watch and see what happens. Absolutely. It's kind of one of those fundamental problems we've been trying to answer since the dawn of civilization, you know, how to incentivize <laughs> certain behaviors uh, and collaborations, how to disincentivize bad actors. Um, really love what Shapeshift has done. I think it was the biggest 
airdrop in history. Uh, they they uh, tagged it as. Um, well, before I let you go, I'm here currently in New York for NFT NYC, and uh, it's just amazing to see Times Square bu- wrapped buses, <laughs> NFT projects advertising everywhere, and um, really seeing like crypto adoption on a massive scale. Uh, and it's just a lot of fun with all of the art. Uh, just got to get some of your thoughts on on NFTs. Do you own any? What's your favorite projects? Um, what is blockchain.com thinking about NFTs? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we're super excited to be at Art Basel um, in Miami in just a few weeks. And we'll hopefully have uh, some things to share with the community and the not too distant future. Um, look, I am so excited to finally see the creators, um, the, you know, the, the individuals in our economy that are um, challenging the status quo uh, with you know, how we look at ourselves, how we look at our content, at our media. Um, and adopting digital currencies as a medium um, for having real ownership over the things that they've built. For too long, the creators in the world, the musicians, the artists, the writers, um, they, they haven't been properly taken care of for their tremendous contributions that they make for our society. Um, I don't think NFTs are going away at all. Um, I love all the applications in the sports and entertainment world. Um, that are coming to fruition. I think it's going to completely change how fans experience games and how they share moments that they have witnessed in the real world with their friends in the long term. So uh, I'm long term bullish on all this stuff. Um, in the short term, you know, I think you see some outrageous, ridiculous things happening. People should be cautious as you know what they're actually uh, acquiring when they you know uh, shop for NFTs online. You know, make sure you're operating in a, uh, a trusted venue. Um, check your counterparties, you know, basic rules of the road, um, just like you wouldn't buy stuff in a dark alley necessarily if you uh, weren't extraordinarily confident um, in that outcome. You know, the same thing applies on the internet here. So uh, there are good reasons to be encouraged and excited. There's also, you know, some uh, rules of the road that I'd encourage people uh, a basic modicum of caution on as it relates to buying stuff on the internet with your crypto. Absolutely. Uh, Stay safe out there, everyone, as you're collecting (laughs) your exciting new NFTs. Well, uh, for anyone just tuning in, you've been watching Reimagine. Uh, This is our 11th event. We're talking about DAOs, NFTs, Bitcoin being legal tender in El Salvador, and some of the current market trends and predictions for the rest of 2021. Thanks for joining us. We've been speaking with Nicholas Carey, co-founder and president of blockchain.com. Thank you so much for joining us, Nicholas. Thank you, Meredith. Have a wonderful afternoon.